Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have a bunch of space news updates to cover once again, from the ever busy activities at Starbase, launch news from across the globe, North Korea attempted to launch a satellite into orbit, the most humans in orbit ever was achieved, Artemis V engine tests continue, Starship rival Project Jarvis appears to be growing in prototype numbers, and a whole bunch of other stuff to discuss. Let's crack on, beginning with Starship news. The skyline at Starbase underwent a big change last week as we said goodbye to the low bay. Here's some time-lapse footage from Lab Padre showing this being built in 2019. The low bay remained a landmark at Starbase for nearly four years, but alas, SpaceX's requirements exceed what the building can offer now, so it was demolished in order to make room for the expansion of the Star Factory. This is the area that's been cleared out to make way for the massive building expansion, and so the factory could end up being this big by the time this phase of its construction is complete. Other buildings, such as the Fabrication Building, also underwent either full or partial disassembly last week. Now, it's not believed that the three tents here will be part of the destruction being made to clear out the area for the Star Factory, but who knows, they may end up being on the chopping block as well. An argument in favour of this theory is the fact that over the course of the past week, SpaceX removed the nose cones for Ship 30, 31, 32 and 33 from tent number 3. One structure that's not going anywhere anytime soon is the Mega Bay, and it was once again a hive of activity last week. The biggest event that we saw last week was the full stacking of Booster 11, bringing the latest Super Heavy to full height. Let's hope that Booster 11 has a more successful life than Starship 11, which as we all know exploded during its flight test, and in dense fog as well, so we didn't even get to see it. At least we have Cosmic Perspective's amazing footage of the remains of Ship 11 raining down. Yeah, let's hope uh, Booster 11 doesn't meet a similar fate. Alongside the Mega Bay is the rapidly rising second high bay, which now has all four sides vertical. Lab Fadre also captured the arrival of the first pieces of side cladding arriving at the site. The white metalwork of the bay might remind you of the high bay metalwork at the Florida Starbase site, and that's because it is the metalwork from Florida. Yep, Roberts Road Starbase is looking pretty barren right now. The high bay site is now completely devoid of all metalwork, and everything else is largely at a standstill. We've seen no real activity around the seven launch tower segments, and the chopsticks haven't moved either. The completed star factory is all closed up, though I can't imagine there's much activity going on in there. SpaceX are seemingly shifting all priority to Boca Chica. We presumably won't see much Starship activity in Florida until we at least get a fully successful Starship launch from Texas. Back in Texas now, foundational work at the launch pad continues, with pile driving and concrete pouring continuing to repair the crater left in the wake of Booster 7's launch. The launch sites should be getting a more robust power supply soon as well. It's so far been dependent on generators, but SpaceX have been digging a trench along the highway in order to run power cables to the area. In terms of launches we saw last week, late on Tuesday a fresh set of 52 Starlink satellites took off from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, packed together in the payload fairing of a Falcon 9 rocket. The rocket's first stage, B-1062, having been used for the 14th time, shut down its engines and separated from the Falcon 9's upper stage around two and a half minutes into the mission, before making a controlled descent down to the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship. The upper stage accelerated the satellites to orbital velocity and subsequently released them roughly 17 minutes after liftoff. SpaceX announced that the launch was a success, which was significant because with the success of this mission, Falcon 9 has now made 200 consecutive flawless flights, and this was the 206th straight successful launch of the Falcon family, which includes Falcon Heavy. This kind of reliability is unprecedented for orbital rockets, and it's great to see Falcon 9 continue to impress. With the inclusion of the 52 Starlink satellites launched on Tuesday night's Falcon 9 mission, the total number of Starlink spacecraft launch has reached 4,521. This wasn't the only Starlink mission last week. On Sunday, SpaceX launched Starlink Group 6-4 from Cape Canaveral. This was great to witness as this was another Starlink V2 launch, meaning that the Falcon 9 carried only 22 satellites, since the V2s are much larger than the V1s. The Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed 637 kilometers downrange on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas. 
NASA is making significant progress towards future Artemis missions to the moon as they successfully conducted a hot fire test on the 1st of June. This test, carried out once again on the Fred Hayes test stand at NASA's Stennis Space Center, marked the ninth out of 12 critical tests. The purpose of this series of tests is to certify the production of the new upgraded RS-25 engines by Aerojet Rocketdyne for use on upcoming deep space missions starting with Artemis V. During the test, the RS-25 engine was powered for over 8 minutes, the same duration to launch the SLS rocket and send astronauts and the Orion spacecraft to orbit, and notably, the engine was fired at 113% power, surpassing the 111% needed to safely propel astronauts, providing engineers with an operational safety margin. These advancements in RS-25 engine certification are setting the stage for NASA's future lunar missions under the Artemis program. In Space Station news now, the recent all-private Axiom-2 mission to the International Space Station wrapped up last week, with the crew successfully returning to Earth after spending nine days in space. The Axiom-2 crew successfully undocked from the Harmony module on Tuesday, and during their time on the orbiting laboratory, they conducted various experiments. One notable achievement was that AX-2 commander Peggy Whitson set a new US record for the most days in space, with a total of 675 days across four spaceflights. But the action doesn't stop there. As one spacecraft bids farewell to the space station, another one is gearing up for its mission. SpaceX's 28th commercial resupply mission is scheduled to blast off from the Kennedy Space Center today, the 5th of June. Hopefully all goes well, and I'll be able to discuss it in detail in next Monday's video. So now is a good time to make sure that you're subscribed so that you get this video delivered straight to your sub feed as soon as it drops. And of course, if you are enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to leave a little like down below. It really helps me out to stay above water in the algorithm and all that. Anyway, the uncrewed Dragon spacecraft is loaded with scientific experiments and technology demonstrations that have the potential to benefit humanity both on and off the planet. One of the payloads on board is the Thor Davis, an investigation brought by the European Space Agency. By leveraging the space station's vantage point above the Earth, researchers hope to observe the electrical activities above thunderstorms, especially those captivating blue discharges. The goal of this experiment is to estimate the energy of these phenomena and understand their impact on the atmosphere. This newfound knowledge could greatly improve our atmospheric models and enhance our understanding of Earth's climate and weather patterns. In terms of other space station stuff to get ready for this week, on Friday, NASA astronauts Steve Bowen and Woody Hoburg will conduct the first of two spacewalks to install two new rollout solar arrays on the exterior of the station. It's an essential task because, over time, the existing legacy arrays degrade, as expected with aging. To keep up with the increasing power demands for the ongoing research and the incorporation of Axiom modules on the station, it's crucial to boost the station's power capacity. With each new rollout solar array, the station will generate over 20 kilowatts of electricity, resulting in a remarkable 30% increase in power production compared to the current arrays. Rewinding now back to the completed Axiom-2 mission, last week SpaceX shared tracking footage of the Falcon 9 first stage returning to Earth after launching the Crew Dragon. I want to show you this footage for two reasons. Firstly, look at it! <laughs> the rocket coming down is so graceful that it's easy to forget that we're essentially seeing a 15-story building scream its way down to Earth. The novelty of watching Falcon 9 land will never wear off for me. The other thing that I want to show you with this is what's in the background upon touchdown. Is that a silo? Or a starship? Actually, it's neither. <laughs> it looks like there is now not only one, but two Project Jarvis prototypes out in the wild. Jarvis is Blue Origin's answer to Starship, a reusable upper stage for the also in development New Glenn. Given that Blue Origin are so much more secretive than SpaceX when it comes to rocket development, we don't really know how far along they're coming, but these do look quite similar to Starship SN4, and maybe that means that we'll get some SN5 and SN6 style hops very soon, and then maybe even some high altitude flight tests. Gosh, I miss those days and would love to relive some of those SN8 memories with Blue Origin. In a major milestone for China's space program, the country has launched its Shenzhou-16 mission, sending its first civilian astronaut into orbit. The three Taikonauts, Jin Haipeng, Zhu Yangzhu, and Gu Haichao, I am so sorry if I butchered those names, took off from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center in China's Gansu province on Tuesday, heading towards the Tiangong space station. The successful launch of the Shenzhou-16 mission is a significant step towards China's long-term goal of a manned lunar landing by 2030. This demonstrates China's commitment to advancing its space exploration and scientific endeavors on a global scale. 
The spacecraft autonomously docked to the station's Nadir port of the Tianhe core module shortly after launch, and the crew were united with the crew of the Shenzhou 15 mission. With their replacements all successfully boarded, the crew of Shenzhou 15 boarded their spacecraft a few days later, on Saturday, before undocking from the core module and then deorbiting and successfully landing at the Dongfeng landing site at the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, China, concluding the Taikonaut's six-month mission to the China Space Station. However, before the Shenzhou 15 departure, in the short amount of time when both the Shenzhou 15 and 16 crews were aboard the station, we hit a new record for the number of people in Earth orbit. The Shenzhou 16 mission boosted the population in orbit to 17, which beats the previous record set by the Inspiration4 mission back in September 2021, when there were 14 people up there. Let's break down the current count. We have the three Taikonauts of Shenzhou 16 on China's Tiangong space station, and the three Taikonauts of Shenzhou 16, also on the Tiangong. Then there's Expedition 69, who are comprised of three cosmonauts from Russia's Roscosmos, three NASA astronauts, and one astronaut from the United Arab Emirates, all of whom are aboard the International Space Station. Then we have the four members of the Axiom 2 crew, also aboard the International Space Station. Another fun fact here is that, purely by chance, the current record includes the 600th person to enter Earth's orbit. Rihanna Barnawi, part of the AX2 mission, who became the milestone traveller on the 21st of May. She's also the first Saudi woman to venture into space. Now, on Tuesday, North Korea made its first satellite launch attempt in seven years, and it didn't go as planned. The Cholima-1 rocket, carrying the Maligyong-1 satellite, didn't make it to its intended orbit after an anomaly occurred during the first stage separation. The rocket ended up falling into the sea near South Korea, where the debris was recovered by South Korean forces. The Maligyong-1 was supposed to be a reconnaissance satellite equipped with cameras to capture images of the Earth for analysis, claimed to have imaging capabilities of up to 20 meter resolution and the ability to transmit multispectral images and videos. The Cholima-1 rocket used in this launch is believed to be its first flight, although North Korea's rocket programs are shrouded in secrecy, making this hard to confirm. Interestingly, this launch comes shortly after South Korea's own rocket launch, adding to the recent activity on the Korean peninsula. North Korea has expressed its intention to attempt another launch once the investigation is complete and necessary tests are carried out. Speaking of failures, Boeing's highly anticipated Starliner astronaut mission, originally slated for the 21st of July, won't be taking off this summer now, after Boeing declared its crew capsule delayed indefinitely. The latest setback comes from two significant safety issues that emerged during extensive reviews of the Starliner spacecraft last week. Firstly, engineers discovered that the soft links used on the parachute suspension lines have a lower failure load limit than previously believed. This poses a problem as the links must be able to withstand the load of the Starliner if one parachute fails. NASA requires the ability to land safely with at least two functioning chutes for crewed flights. The second safety concern relates to the flammability of the protective tape covering the wiring harnesses inside the Starliner capsule. It was revealed that there are considerable lengths of this tape, making it a potential fire hazard. However, simply removing the tape is not a viable solution as this could cause further damage. Instead, Boeing is exploring alternative methods to minimize the risk of fire in the most vulnerable areas of the spacecraft. This delay adds to the series of setbacks experienced by Boeing Starliner. In December 2019, the first uncrewed test flight failed to reach its intended orbit and it couldn't rendezvous with the International Space Station as planned, resulting in an early landing. Subsequently, Boeing was required to address 80 corrective actions recommended by NASA following an investigation. A repeat uncrewed test flight was launched in May 2022 after several delays due to valve issues. Although this flight encountered the same issues with the flammable tape and parachute links, it was deemed a success by NASA. Boeing is contractually obligated to provide at least seven crewed flights for NASA, including the crew flight test and six operational missions. Despite the setbacks, Boeing affirmed that it is committed to the Starliner and is fulfilling its obligations to NASA, stating that a full launch is feasible, but they refrain from committing to specific dates. Laon Aerospace took to the skies as well last week. A very wobbly rocket blasted off the pad of the Kerbal Space Center 2 Space Center, carrying the Kerbals on a tour of the Kerbin system to the Mun and Minmus. 
The primary focus of this video though wasn't the mission itself. Instead, I just used this as background footage for me to talk about what the development, what the third patch for Kerbal Space Program 2 is looking like. I covered a bunch of developer updates and discussed the new recently revealed science parts, engines and laboratory, as well as a whole host of other things. If this video sounds interesting to you, then it may well be one of the videos now on screen, which can be seen alongside the scrolling list of amazing people who support me on Patreon and YouTube. If you want to see your own name there, then you can follow the links below, but otherwise, that's the end of today's Space News Update. I hope you enjoyed the ride, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.